can be hard to prove something to someone in our culture and in our time. To, to prove something to someone can sometimes be difficult. You know, can we prove that a, a Chevy truck is better than a Ford truck? Can we prove that Gatorade hydrates us better than water? Can we prove that Dove hair soap is better than Suave? Can we prove that Mary Kay makeup is better than Estee Lauder? Can we prove that Gurney seeds are better than generic seeds from Walmart? Sometimes it's hard to prove things to people that have experiences with those same things. And one of the objections that people sometimes have about Christianity is they'll ask us things and they'll ask us questions saying, can you prove to me that the Bible is true? They'll say, can you prove that Jesus was the Son of God? They'll say, can you prove to me that the Bible isn't just fiction? They'll ask, can you prove to me that Jesus did miracles, that he resurrected from the dead, and that he ascended to heaven? Like I said, it's hard to prove things to people in our culture, in our time. But I think we can at certain times as it comes to the Bible. There are parts of the Bible where we can present specific information from archaeology that corroborates what we see in Scripture. And there are times we can show documents in contemporary cultures that uphold what Scripture says as well. And as I share that, we're going to look at a letter today. Not just any letter. We're reading a, a letter from the king of Persia, written to Ezra. He's a pagan king, not a, a Jewish king or a Christian king. He's a pagan king from another culture that has been who wrote a letter that was copied and inserted into our scriptures. And in our time today, I want to take us on a journey in which we'll survey this letter and some of the outside things that were written about the same time and see if the information we have from archaeology corroborates what we read in, Genesis, in Ezra 7, and we'll see if the documents in contemporary culture uphold what we read here in Scripture. And I think this is the best place to do something like this because it's, to use a, a sports metaphor, this is an away game for us. We're not taking a super popular king like David or Solomon that was kind of the pinnacle of Israel's history and looking for references to him in other cultures, but instead we're taking a, a letter written by a pagan king in another culture that's been inserted into our scripture. So this is kind of a, an away game for us where we're going to use this material and look at it and have a discussion on its terms, not scripture's terms. So we're in Ezra chapter 7, and just a little review of how we have ended up here in verse 11 from in chapter 7. As you know, the Jews were sent into exile in Babylon for almost 70 years because of their disobedience to God. But King Cyrus of Persia comes to Babylon and he conquers Babylon and he issues a decree allowing people to go back to their lands, to their home countries. We know that from the, the Cyrus Cylinder, this little cylinder that's actually in London in the British Museum, which is a general decree allowing people to go back, similar to what we read in chapter 1 of Ezra. So Zerubbabel takes a group of people back to Jerusalem to try to rebuild their temple and restore the community. They build an altar and they restore the temple foundation and then they kind of get stopped there for about 15 years. And then two prophets show up, Haggai and Zechariah. And they get Zerubbabel and the other people to start building again. And five years later, in 515 B.C., they, they build the temple in Jerusalem. But the work stops there. We fast forward 57 years later, and a guy named Ezra comes on the scene in Jerusalem. 57 years have passed, and that's what we read last week. Our introduction in chapter 7, verses 1 through 11, oriented us to who this man Ezra was. And now today we're reading the letter that gave Ezra permission and provisions to return to the land. 
So we're going to spend most of our time looking at this letter in verses 11 to 26, the, the support that Ezra is given by the king. And an introduction is read here in verses 11 and 12 that orient us to this letter. We read, now this is the copy of the decree which King Artaxerxes gave to Ezra the priest, the scribe, learned in the words of the commandments of the Lord and his statutes to Israel. Artaxerxes, king of kings, Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of the God of heaven, perfect peace and now. Now verse 11 is our connecting verse from that introduction to Ezra and verses 1 through 10 and then verse 12 the letter begins but 11 is our connecting verse. We don't know why this letter was written but perhaps Ezra had asked for permission to return to Jerusalem and maybe this letter is what the king gave Ezra. And he's called a scribe there that we discussed last week, a scribe during the post-exilic time in Babylon, probably dedicated all of his time to copying the law and teaching the law to a group of people that had never been to Jerusalem, that had never seen the temple. It was probably his main job was to, to copy the law and teach the law to people, to teach the Old Testament. So verse 11, that's our last verse in, in Hebrew. And verse 12 switches to Aramaic because the Persians spoke in Aramaic. So verses 12 to 26 are the words that this king, Artaxerxes of Persia, probably spoke or had dictated. And it appears Ezra just copies the letter in verbatim and he preserves it in the Aramaic language that the king would have written in. And verse 12 begins the correspondence. This letter kind of served like a passport for Ezra, giving him permission to go where he needed to go and giving him resources that he needed along the way. So we, need, we read the, the correspondence here beginning in verse 12 to Ezra. And as we look at this letter, starting in verse 12, there are seven places I want to pause briefly where we're going to look at what the contemporary culture says about the things we read about in this letter, right? The, the contemporary culture connections, there are going to be seven of them that we will see and that I will make my case to you, and most of them are there in your notes. And the first contemporary cultural connection here we see is in the greeting in verse 12. There are four parts to this greeting that match other Persian letters at that time. We see the author, King Artaxerxes, King of Kings. That's the first part of this greeting. Then we see the recipient, Ezra, the priest and scribe. Then we see a, a greeting. In my translation, it reads perfect peace. And then we see a transition word and now, or a transition phrase, and now. That was a common way Persian letters began at that time with those four elements, and we see those same four elements here in this letter. Doesn't really prove anything, but it is a similar way that correspondence was written at this time in the Persian Empire. So verses 11 and 12 kind of introduce us to this letter, and then we see the permission that's given to Ezra in verses 13 to 20. And in these verses, King Artaxerxes promises provisions for the temple worship, and King Artaxerxes grants authority to Ezra and outlines responsibilities for Ezra. And there are four responsibilities. The first is to take people back with him in verse 13. We read, King Artaxerxes says, I have issued a decree that any of the people of Israel and their priests and the Levites in my kingdom who are willing to go to Jerusalem may go with you. Most of the chapter 8 is dedicated to telling us who these people are. Then we see a second responsibility for Ezra to, to check on the law in verse 14. King Artaxerxes says, For as much as you are sent by the king, and his seven counselors to inquire concerning Judah and Jerusalem according to the law of your God, which is in your hand. Now our second contemporary cultural connection is regarding these seven counselors that this king mentions. 
that it's the king's decree, but he also has these seven counselors. These are men of the highest caliber that would give the king advice on matters. And there is a historian, a Greek writer and historian named Herodotus, who lived at the same time as King Artaxerxes. He was a Greek writer and historian. He lived in Persia, and he wrote about the Greek and Persian wars. And he writes about the king, and I have the citations there in your notes, about how the king of Persia often had seven counselors that gave him advice. And there's another historian named Xenophon. He was a Greek military leader, philosopher, and historian. He was a student and a friend of the philosopher Socrates. And he writes in his book, Anabasis, about his travels in antiquity. He was about 50 years younger than King Artaxerxes, but he also tells in two different places of his work, Anabasis, about how the king of Persia usually had seven counselors that gave him advice. Which is interesting, if you read chapter one of the book of Esther, when the king of Persia issues the queen to come and she doesn't show up, there are seven counselors that give the king advice about what to do with that queen. Chapter one, verse 14. So we read here, what we read in this letter from the Persian king matches what historians living at the same time as this king say about the king from Herodotus and Xenophon. And Herodotus is known as one of the best historical sources for the Persian empire. There have been many people that have validated what he says and from both history and archeology. span so that's our second connection, that these seven counselors were known by people within the Persian Empire writing about it at the time of King Artaxerxes and a short time after. So the king gives Ezra a couple of responsibilities to take the people back to check on the law. A third responsibility is to transport money in verse 15 through 18. We read that the king says to Ezra, bring the silver and gold which the king and his counselors have freely offered to the God of Israel, whose dwelling is in Jerusalem, with all the silver and gold which you find in the whole province of Babylon, along with the free will offering of the people and the priests who offered willingly for the house of their God, which is in Jerusalem. With this money, therefore, you shall diligently buy bulls, rams, lambs, with their grain offerings and their drink offerings and offer them on the altar of the house of your God, which is in Jerusalem. Verse 18, whatever seems good to you and to your brothers to do with the rest of the silver and gold, you may do according to the will of your God. Now this might seem odd that a a king is giving money for religious restoration and religious services, but back then, the idea of government and God being separated isn't kind of like we think now, that we don't want you know, them to be mixing. Instead, there were so many gods around and existing as the king. You wanted to appease all those gods, and you wanted those gods to be on your side. So kings would often try to spend money and use their resources to, to get people to support the God and therefore maybe be loyal to the king. And there's a third connection point here as we read here in verse 16, that there are some writings that I've listed there in your notes. It's a kind of secondary sources, not primary, that there were similar funds given by kings to Jews that went to live in Elephantine in Egypt, which is a southern part of Egypt, as well as other religious groups in Egypt and Babylon. Right, and I've got that in the footnotes there. Apparently, this was not just a unique thing where a king gave resources and money to these Jews. These kings regularly gave money and resources, and there's evidence of them doing it for people living in Babylon still and in Elephantine, a specific part of Egypt. So that's our third connection there. A fourth one is by a guy named Josephus you might have heard of. Josephus is the, the best known first century historian. He was a, a Jewish man fighting in the Jewish wars, but he got captured by the Romans and kind of defects to the Romans and spent the rest of his life writing a history 
of different things, mostly about the Jewish history. And in there, he talks about, Josephus talks about how there was a common practice for Jews living outside of Jerusalem, wherever they might have been, to send money to Jerusalem to help Jews, kind of in a similar way here, but that that stopped during one of the wars when the king of the Roman Empire forced the Jews to send their money and resources to Jupiter, or sorry, yeah, Jupiter instead, which was a big issue. But Josephus says this was a common practice for centuries before that. So that's our third connection that we see. So we have these responsibilities that are given to Ezra. The fourth one we see in 19 and 20. The king gives a responsibility to, to Ezra to deliver these vessels, these utensils to Jerusalem. Starting in verse 19, the king says to Ezra, also the utensils which are given to you for the service of the house of your God, deliver in full before the God of Jerusalem. The rest of the needs for the house of your God for which you may have occasion to provide, provide for it from the royal treasury. See, this had already been done in chapter one by Cyrus. He had told Zerubbabel to take all the vessels back, but maybe there were some that they had overlooked. Maybe the Persian king had donated some and given some. We're not sure why, but chapter eight again gives us more details, and there's 122 of these items that they bring back with them. So that's the permission that King Artaxerxes of Persia gives to Ezra to return. Then we read specifically in verses 21 to 24, this commission, this focused task that the king gives to Ezra. Verse 21 reads, I, even I, King Artaxerxes, issue a decree to all the treasurers who were in the provinces beyond the river, that whatever Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of the God of heaven, may require of you, it shall be done diligently. Up to 100 talents of silver, 100 cores of wheat, 100 baths of wine, 100 baths of oil and salt as needed. Whatever is commanded by the God of heaven, let it be done with zeal for the house of the God of heaven, so that there will not be wrath against the kingdom of the king and his sons. We also inform you that it is not allowed to impose tax, tribute, or toll on any of the priests, Levites, singers, doorkeepers, nithinim, or servants of the house of God. See, in these four verses, 21 to 24, King Artaxerxes provides permission to Ezra to with withdraw funds from the, the areas west of the Euphrates River, that area beyond the river. The king directs the treasures in that area to give to Ezra what he might need. We read about that silver, wheat, wine, oil, and salt. And this is where we see our fifth contemporary connection there, specifically on those issues. A man named Antiochus III, who was a Greek king from 241 to 187 BC, so about 200 years later, he gave similar resources to Jews in Jerusalem for the worship of Yahweh. Again, we re read about this from Josephus, who writes in the first century about that. But Josephus describes how Antiochus III, a, a Greek king, specifically gave animals, wine, oil, silver, flour, wheat, and salt. He gave those specific issues for Jews living in the same city to worship their God. So again, does this prove anything? Not sure, but it... They are close connections and parallels. That's in verse 22. And then verse 24, we have a, a sixth connection to the culture at that time. That same king, Antiochus III, and another king, Darius, who was two kings before Artaxerxes. It goes Darius, Xerxes, Artaxerxes. Artaxerxes is the one writing this letter. So two kings prior to Artaxerxes, Darius, they gave a similar tax exemption for temple personnel, which we learn about from Josephus again in his book Antiquities of the Jews. He gave an exemption for 
temple personnel at that time to not have to pay taxes, people that worked in the Jewish temple. And then Darius, who was a Persian king, we have a letter of him writing to a man named Gadatas in Ionium, a, a area of Turkey. He writes a letter to this man that was taxing people working at the temple. And Darius condemns this man and tells him he needs to stop because the people in this case were working on the garden outside of the temple. And Darius said they should be exempt from paying taxes. Very similar to what Artaxerxes says here in scripture to Ezra and his people returning. The last part of this letter, the verses 25 and 26, are more of a, a deputation, kind of given Ezra even more permission to establish law and order in the land. Verse 25, King Artaxerxes writes, You, Ezra, According to the wisdom of your God, which is in your hand, appoint magistrates and judges that they may judge all the people who are in the province beyond the river, even all those who know the laws of your God. And you may teach anyone who is ignorant of them. Whoever will not observe the law of your God and the law of the king, let judgment be executed upon him strictly whether for death or for banishment or for confiscation of goods or for imprisonment. In these two verses, the king gives Ezra, he provides Ezra permission to withdraw, to establish kind of a judicial system and set up an educational system to teach people about it. He grants Ezra authority to institute judicial reforms in the area. He gives Ezra permission to appoint magistrates and judges in the region and gives Ezra a formal position in the region to establish laws. And that leads to our seventh connection to culture. Again, Darius, who was the king, two kings before Artaxerxes, he had sent a man named Uda Jehora Senet. Out of all the old names I've ever read, that is probably the most difficult one. And I practiced it three or four times. Darius the first sent this man who was a priest and scholar, similar to Ezra, to Egypt to establish law and order in Egypt. And this took place in 518 to 503 BC, so about 50 years before Artaxerxes. King Darius sent this man to Egypt, which you'd have to travel past Jerusalem to get to Egypt. And this man spent those years, those 15 years, codifying the Egyptian laws with another group of men and establishing a system. We read about this in what's called the Demotic Chronicle, which is a commentary on the Persian kings from an Egyptian perspective, judging those kings for their good or bad behavior. Very similar to what we see King Dari Artaxerxes doing about 50, 75 years later. He sends Ezra back to establish law and order in Jerusalem, similar to how Artaxerxes' grandfather, Darius I, had sent Ujicha Horasenet back to Egypt. Okay? So that's our letter, the support for Ezra. Verses 28 and 29 is... Pam read for us of the statement of Ezra. This is Ezra's commentary about this letter. We read, verse 27 and 28 read, Blessed be the Lord, the God of our fathers, who has put such a thing as this in the king's heart to adorn the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem, and has extended loving kindness to me before the king and his counselors and before all the king's mighty princes. Thus I was strengthened according to the hand of the Lord my God upon me. And I gathered leading men from Israel to go up with me. Now here, as we read in Ezra, the book of Ezra, verse 27 transitions back to the Hebrew text. And we probably could have had an eighth cultural connection here because people that study Aramaic would read that letter and classify it as the dialect of Aramaic, which they call Imperial Aramaic. It was common from 700 BC to 200 BC. 
This letter was written in 458 BC, so it fits right in the middle of that time period, and the type of Aramaic that we read matches the time period that we believe it was written in. So we're back in Hebrew as Ezra writes this commentary on the letter in verses 27 and 28. And Ezra's response to the king tells us a little bit about the type of man that Ezra was. Notice that he praised God. He said, blessed be the Lord. He connected his God to his ancestors, saying the God of our father. He recognized that it was God working, not him. He also saw that this was for God's glory, not his own personal ambition and glory. See, I think Ezra realized that even though Persian kings were usually generous to the, the conquered people and provided to them, God didn't have to make this Persian king this generous. That God is making the Persian king probably overly abundant in his provisions and his help. The Persians were a stark contrast to the Babylonians and the Assyrians. That's another side issue, but the way that those two groups treat the Israelites matches contemporary history as well because the Assyrians assimilated them together. The Babylonians kind of baptized the Israelites into their culture. But the Persians wanted the people to go back to their lands. Matthew Henry, who has free commentaries you might have heard about that are available online, he says, God can put things into men's hearts which would not arise there of themselves and into their heads too both by his providence and by his grace. I think Ezra recognized this as what was going on. And we should recognize it too. What's going on in our lives that only God could orchestrate and create? What experiences does he have us go through, maybe good or bad or difficult or terrible that he uses to draw us closer to him or to make our relationship with him more intimate or to give us a way to minister to others we never would be able to do before or to, to purge our independence and make us more reliant on him? What are those things that we can recognize God doing in our circumstances? Is there a person that he brought into our life that we needed and depend on desperately? Maybe a job or a boss that we desperately needed or family members. Like Ezra, we should be aware of God working in our lives and orchestrating things in our lives that we can't explain in a similar way to what Ezra saw the Persian king doing. And Ezra praised God for it and gave God the glory. And notice that word in verse 28. God has extended loving kindness to me. That's the Hebrew word hesed that's used throughout the Old Testament. It means loving kindness. It describes God's covenant love for his people and God's love born out of loyalty and commitment, not a feeling. It's translated by some as loyal love or God's favor in the NIV or the ESV. I like translated lates it as steadfast love. See, Ezra, through this experience, knew of God's steadfast love, and we too should know and, and feel it and be reminded of his steadfast love for us as well. Well, as we wrap up our time together, I know we did things a little different, a little more technical to listen to, and definitely was more technical for me to type up with these names and locations and different people. But I've shared this with you, not because we're trying to prove things to each other or prove the Bible to others, but I wanted to share them with you because I, I want you to trust the word of God when you read it. I hope what you've seen today, these seven or eight things, strengthens your trust in God's word. And I've included, included the, the references there in your handout, so you can use that if you have a a family member or a coworker or a neighbor that sometimes ha have those conversations with you. Those are the references. You can point to them from a little obscure portion of scripture and seven or eight cross references to culture that matches what we read. Not sure it will prove to them the Bible is true, but gives you the ability to have a conversation 
And when we read these, what we call post-exilic books, these books about the Jews after their exile in Babylon, there are lots of these cross-references and connections. I haven't been able to emphasize them as much, but I wanted to this week. But there's lots of these connections throughout this part of our Bible to the culture that we know from history. Now, some parts of the Bible, we don't have a lot of connection. And we'll be honest to admit that when we talk to people. If someone says, can you prove to me from the Egyptian records that Moses and Aaron were in Egypt and that Israel left? We say, no, there's nothing in the Egyptian records that describes that. No king, Pharaoh, that also thought he was a god would let anybody write anything that showed him being humiliated is the real truth. They would never let someone write about how these two brothers show up and humiliate him and his magicians. Someone might say, can you prove to me that Abraham left Ur and arrived in Canaan 2000 BC? We have to say, well, there weren't really passports then that we can see a stamp. There weren't really checkpoints along the border to record those things. We don't really have evidence for that. Someone might ask you, can you tell me where the Garden of Eden would have been? Well, it was 6,000 years ago, and geography is always kind of changing, and the fall affected things. I'm not sure we can kind of point to them where the Garden of Eden might have been. But I hope you've seen today through these seven connections in this part of Scripture, in the book of Ezra, there is lots of reasons we trust God's word. We might not be able to prove it to people, but I do believe we can trust it as Christians. And while I want you to trust the word of God, I also want you to trust the God of the word. Because we trust his word, we trust the God that's described in it. If what we read about Ezra is absolutely true, then I think we can make the connection. What we read about in Genesis is true. What we read about Jesus and the Gospel of John is true. What we read about in Revelation is true as well. And the truth is this that I'll end about on. God exists. God is sovereign. God is powerful. God is supreme. He knows you. He knows me. He cares for you and me. He sent his son to die for us. And he is coming back. Let's pray. Lord, thanks for a place that we get to gather with our physical family and even, maybe even our spiritual family. Definitely our spiritual family. Lord, if we're here by ourselves, we come to other, our brothers and sisters in you, Lord, that have placed their faith in you, that trust you and trust your word. I pray you would give us confidence in what we read in scripture. We might not have all the answers for people, but maybe this can be a chapter we take people to and we have a discussion with them about what we read from this pagan king and how it matches what other historians or other archaeological finds have found as well. Please give us the words to say and the attitude of how to represent you in those conversations maybe with our family members or our co-workers or our neighbors or fellow students at school. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'll invite you to stand for the benediction and we'll be dismissed. Wasn't sure if that was going to have to be a part one and part two, but we made it. So thanks for hanging in there with me. From Philippians chapter 4, a, a doxology and a benediction here. Paul writes, My God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. Now in our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. You're dismissed.